being here and for your partnership uh, with United Way and the conference and uh, present, uh, presenting it uh, today. Uh, we're also very proud of the partnership that this community has with so many other organizations that are in attendance. Um, one of those great relationships that we have is with Kino, the Quality Enhancement for Nonprofit Organizations, which is a program of UNCW. <coughs> Kino coach Karen Dash is an award-winning program analyst with 10 plus years of experience in academic, government, and corporate settings. Many times the success or failure of a grant rests on how you can demonstrate that you'll do what you promised to do to get that money. That usually fails um, or is a success because you have done a good program evaluation section. Ms. Dash brings a proven track record of synthesizing complex information to create program evaluations, research designs, business models, and training programs tailored to a variety of audiences. She's a published author, author of over 15 consumer business articles, co-author of five insurance industry white papers, and a two-time winner of the American Express Chairman's Award for Quality. As a personal note, we've used Karen on a couple occasions for some consulting with our partners in the community, um, and all of them reported a great success working with Karen and really appreciated that assistance. So I hope today's session is very valuable to you. And with that, uh, with that I'll go ahead and turn it over. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's make sure that I can master this before I go on. I guess that it'll just start, is that? Oh no, that's what it did to me. Okay. Do it again. More time. Thirty seconds. Oh, this is me making. I'm controlling time now. Okay. Wow. Ten seconds. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm so mesmerized by my power here. <laughs> okay. Program evaluation. Okay, thank you all for being here today. Um, again, my name is Karen Dash, and I'm, I'm glad that you're spending this time with me to talk about program evaluation. I think we have about an hour together. Um, it would help me if we could just go around the room really quickly and everyone could just give me your name and the organization that you work for. Just give me a sense of, of the kind of folks we have in the room. Would you mind starting? Yes, my name is Alex Shreve. I'm the chairperson for the Onslow Commission for Persons with Disabilities. <coughs> Kim Oliver, I'm on the uh, board of directors for the Jacksonville Onslow Sports Commission. I'm Iris Borman with the Foundation for Hospice. Kim Kimball, a board member for the Museum of the Marine. Mary Waller, board member for Bold of Jacksonville. Gail Alvis, board member for United Way. Fumina Rosario, board member for Pre-Trial Resource Center. Edie Uzel, board member with USO. Deb Fisher, director of the USO North Carolina Jacksonville. Natasha, director of Kino. Mm -hmm. uh, Fatima, Miracle Vista, Kino. <coughs> Carol Long, Onslow <coughs> United Transit System. Star Rogers with the Fire Region Beyond the Obvious. Tracy Jackson, City of Jacksonville. Billy Gray, mm -hmm. board member of Bundy Life Community Outreach and the Affordable Housing Group. Carol Davis, I'm with Tri County Crusades, we're a re entry program. Laura Hagerman, the Salvation Army. Connie Winter, Director from Council for the Arts. Cindy Jones, Board Member of Coastal Carolina Artists and Crafters Bill. Judith Pirates, Board Member of the Council for the Arts. I'm Carolyn Jensen, I'm a Board Member on the Onslow Women's Center. Uh, I'm Cindy Brown, I'm also on the Women's Center. I'm Sheila Judon, with the Onslow Women's Center. Marie Brody, Onslow Women's Center. Hey, hi. Danielle Grant, Special Education Alliance. Mm -hmm. Wendy Boyd, Special Education Alliance. Thank you. Thank you. Please. <laughs> and Craig. Great. Well, well, thank you all. I mean, it's, it's exciting to me to see so many different organizations and viewpoints represented here. Please feel free to talk or ask questions or, or interrupt me as we go. I have about 15 slides, as uh, you may know. I don't know if you have handouts. And, um, you please feel free to interrupt me or we'll have questions at the end. We'll have plenty of time for that. Um, I guess I'm just going to start by asking, what do you think of when you think of program evaluation? Is it effective? Is it worth continuing? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think of it, how are we doing? <laughs> yes. 
thought I, I like these answers better mm. than some of the answers I get. I think some people <laughs> see it as a necessary evil, and that's <laughs> putting it nicely. Um, I think I, I was looking at a, a CDC study, and it said something like reducing fear and loathing of program evaluation. <laughs> so it sounds like you're a more informed group, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that about what the program evaluation is all about. I sort of have a oh, there's there's me. Um, sort of talk a little bit about it here. Um, it's sort of, I think that we all work with these amazing organizations and every day we see the changes that we make in people's lives and our clients' lives and, and we know what an impact that has on our community, not only our clients but the larger community as well. I think that part of the problem that our, our funders have and, and potential donors is that you know, unless they're looking over your shoulder every day, they might not be aware of exactly what kind of a um, outcomes are associated with your work, what kind of impact you make on the community. So program evaluation is sort of a formal approach to, to gathering data about your organization and, and analyzing how effective it is. Um, as you heard uh, Commissioner Buchanan say, you know, that he just wants to understand better you know, the impacts that, that organizations have on the community. And there's a lot of, um, well I'll get to that in a minute I suppose, but but uh, program evaluation is also an objective review of an organization's strengths and challenges or areas of opportunity. We can all certainly improve. Um, it's also a tool to inform funders of how their dollars are translating into actual outcomes. Uh, and finally, it's, it's a way to show I exactly what kind of an impact your organization is having on the community. It's sort of this continuous process. It's, it's a, you know, once you start to get into program evaluation and you realize what a great tool it is for, for your organization, I think that it becomes part of the culture. And it's kind of a continuous process. Um, you know, you, start, you can start anywhere on this wheel, really, but you can start by just, you know, kind of taking a look at your organization saying, well, what exactly do we do? Um, and then, you know, how do we do that? What is, what is our mission? How are we trying to accomplish that mission? What strategies, what policies, what programs do we have toward accomplishing the goals and, and the mission of this organization? And then program evaluation helps you to figure out how you're doing, um, you know, within those individual programs, within the organization as a whole. Um, you can try to figure out through the, the process what you're doing well, um, you know, maybe what things we could be doing better, and then kind of how do you take what you've learned and translate that into new programs or policies or, or ways to strengthen uh, what it is your organization does. So that kind of takes you around the loop, but then you just keep going. You know, you might make changes to your programs and policies, but then you have to continue to evaluate it to see if, you know, you're moving in the right direction. Um, you know, I talked a little bit about uh, evaluation, but some people say, well, what do you mean by program exactly? So we could just step back and talk about that. Um, what, what would you all say, how would you identify programs or define programs? Maybe the outreach that your your the outreach that you have to the community. I mean mm -hmm. that's the the form of your outreach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. What what are you doing within your community? You know, what activities, what set of activities do you have that you're trying to further your goals and, and help your community? I've included some examples here, you know, programs that look at, for example, um, uh, hearing loss in, in children at a young age or, or a program that might connect victims of domestic violence with permanent housing, you know, housing choices. Um, perhaps a program to educate families, military families, about their benefits that they're eligible for. Or lastly, a program that provides free meals on a daily basis to, to people in need. So, you know, all of these are programs, um, you know, examples of programs within an organization, you know, under a single mission, you might have several different programs. You might choose to evaluate each of, each of those individual uh, initiatives, or you might want to look at the organization as a whole. So why, why do you think an organization should conduct a program evaluation? To show your productivity. To show your level of productivity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Show your level of productivity. If your program is reaching as many people as you want it to. Yeah, yeah, to get a sense exactly how many people are being affected by your program. Yeah, sometimes that, you know, you, you have a sense of it, but you don't really know. Mm -hmm. To see if your program is doing what you thought it was doing and to see if there are some effects that it has that you either want and like and want more of or don't want. Yes, yes, perhaps unintended effects of your program. Yes. Yeah, how well, oh, Deb? Um, are we still meeting the needs 
or are the needs changing and do we need to change with them? Yes, yes. I know I, I evaluate grants for the U.S. Department of Education and um, maybe five years ago when I was looking at these um, grant applications, they would talk about trying to get a laptop to every child in a particular community, you know, so that they could work from home or just have that connectivity. And I've seen over the last five years that that's changed now to where they t talk about laptops so much as mobile devices, you know, mm -hmm. just getting a cell phone to a child or, or a lap. Um, an iPad or something like that. So their mission has changed, you know, that quickly just because of technology. I mean, that's sort of a technology reason for change. But there are lots of reasons why programs need to evaluate whether they should continue to do what they're doing. Thank you. Yeah. So, so uh, one thing that I, I think <coughs> is important as well is that, as you heard uh, Commissioner Buchanan say, there's a limited pot of money. And I think, you know, Craig, you probably see this, and you know, organizations. You know, throughout the country just don't have necessarily the funding that they used to have. And there's, to my mind, unprecedented competition for those limited resources as well. I see a lot of people shaking their head, or nodding their heads. So I think that probably you all have dealt with some of that. Um, you know, grant makers have to answer to the folks who are, are giving them money. You know, uh, the folks who donate to the United Way, the organizations, the, the um, you know, governmental agencies that donate. Um, taxpayers want to know, you know, I'm looking at these Department of Education grants, you know, they ultimately can go back and see what programs have been funded and what the outcomes are of those programs and say, well, are my tax dollars being used well? So program evaluation is a way to measure exactly what's happening. Um, oftentimes I think, you know, uh, donors or, or the public in general doesn't necessarily know what an organization does. Um, they might have a general sense, you know, if perhaps if if children or, or families is in the, the name of the organization, I might be able to say, oh yeah, they're assisting this population, but they might not know the nuances of, of what that popula uh, rather what that organization does. And, and lastly, I think that, that program evaluation gives you this great opportunity to take this data and to take these results and, and to take these outcomes and shape the story that you want to tell the public. If there's a vacuum out there, if the public doesn't really understand what you do, here you come with all this, you know, this evidence to say, hey, here's how we've impacted you know, this, this community and, and here are the folks we've helped and here's how. So I think it can be a very powerful tool. There are lots of different ways that you can go about your program evaluation. There are lots of different aspects of it as well. Does anyone want to take a guess like what kinds of things you might be, might be evaluating? Changes in behavior from the point of entry to the point of exit. Yes. For example, at-risk kids are great for food from a C when you got them to an A after that school program. Yes, yes, looking at the outcomes, what, what kind of uh, the intervention that you provided, what are the outcomes to that. Do people understand the difference between outputs and outcomes? You know, we, we talk about that a lot. You know, some, I think in the past, funders and organizations generally are more concerned with outputs. And outputs is, is saying, well, we, um, we referred 20 families to um, counseling you know, in, in the last quarter. Or, or 15 children, we referred them to a uh, health clinic. And that's important, outputs are important, but I think now, I think funders want you to go, and, and all of us want you to go just a step further and say, okay, well you referred those 20 families, so what happened after that? You know, what, uh, that's great, but what happened? You know, did they even follow up with the referral? How did their lives change as a result of that? You, know, you got those 20 children, 20 children to this, this new clinic, are they being seen regularly now? Are you seeing the incidence of, of illness going down? Are you seeing vaccination rates go up? Are you seeing school absentee rates go down? There are lots of different ways to measure that. Um, and, uh, so so I, I guess I'll start with kind of a list of, of different things here um, that we might look at, ways to look at our, our, um, our evaluation. One is, does the community need the program? I kept hearing that in Commissioner Buchanan's comments. He kept saying, you know, we're, we're interested in need. How does the community need this? Why does the community need this? Um, you know, perhaps you have a, a program that offers services to teenagers, um, maybe, maybe young women uh, who are looking for, you know, support and guidance uh, as teenagers. And, you know, someone might say, well, there are three or four programs in town that are also helping 
young teenage girls. You know, why do we need your program? We have all these, you know, why can't we just fund these folks? And, and maybe you realize, well, our program helps Hispanic and Latino teenagers. You know, and so that's something that's different. These other programs don't. So you want to think about what needs are your, is your program fulfilling within the community? What makes it unique? What makes it something that these funders are going to want to fund? Yeah, if you don't, you're going to end up with duplicate. They're going to look at it as a duplication yes. of services. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very, you know, you have to put down exactly what you're going to do better than this other program. Yes. And that's hard sometimes, and right, to differentiate because yourself? Because if you want money and you need money for your nonprofit, you have to differentiate yes. yourself from the other programs. Have you found that you've had to do that where you've had a similar program to another in the community? The board I serve on, no, but I have served on boards where there were <laughs> a duplication of services. Yeah. Whereas, actually, in some cases, it would have been better to just have it in one. Yes. Oh, Deb? There's a retired Army colonel that started a program called Soldier 360 probably about four years ago. Um, and she's been doing it. It's a resiliency program. And um, so she's been doing it with the Army for three years, and they've had tremendous success cutting down on suicides, just helping a lot of the issues every human has, but compounded with the military and deployments and everything, theirs yeah. is uh, much worse. And she's been trying to get it in the Marine Corps for the last three years, and of course the Marines always can do everything better themselves, and you know. So we finally had to convince them that she asked the USO for our help, and <clears throat> we finally convinced the 2nd Marine Division to send a Marine to Fort Bragg to sit in on this week-long resiliency program. Well, first of all, Marine doesn't want to have to go to an Army base, but <laughs> uh, I, so they voluntold a Marine who they knew would be very angry to have to be told to go to yet another one of these resiliency programs. Um, at the end of the second day, he called uh, his sergeant major and said, this program has to be in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. Every Marine needs to go through this program, and that was only the second day. Wow. And so. Then they started looking at, okay, why is yours different? And we have an 89% success rate going back three years that they're still using it, the families are staying together, the kids got their dad back, um, marriages are better, financial health is better. I mean, all the get categories are much better. And I sat in on it when we did it here at the beginning of December, and it was amazing. It was amazing seeing these Marines come in every day. There was 46 of them. And they come in kicking and screaming, and I'm like, I've all told again. And by the end of the first day, you can see the body language changes, mm -hmm. facial expressions changes, attitudes changes. But you have to be able to tell that story. And that's, you know, that's a big funding issue we're, we're working on now because it costs, about, costs a lot of money because mm -hmm. the uh, instructors come in from all over the United States. But it's well worth it because some of the Marines at the end of the program said, this not only changed lives, but saves lives. Yes. So, I mean, but that's one of the things, you, how you got to show how you stand out above and beyond other programs that might do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it's not like you want to cut your colleagues down. You know, we're all doing great work, but you want to yeah. show how, how what you do is different and the value that's added by your organization, what makes it unique. It's very non-traditional. I mean, they, they start with yoga classes. <laughs> Every morning loves yoga. <laughs> 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 well, thank you, Deb. Yeah, so you know, it's important to establish a need. And sometimes that takes some work to figure out, well, how am I going to demonstrate that? You know, I, I've looked at you know, crime statistics for a particular area, you know, try to figure out you know, we'll, we'll, what is the incidence of, of these particular crimes and how does this organization address that? Just try to come up with some sort, of, some sort of context for why your organization needs to be where it is, doing the work that it does. And also to demonstrate what what the outcomes would be if your organization wasn't there. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's important too. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Um, we, we might also want to look into whether or not we need to make changes to our program design. Um, you know, there might be an organization that um, maybe they, they assist uh, single moms and children. And so one of the programs or services that they offer is that they, um, they drive moms to doctor's appointments, medical appointments. And right now it's such a small organization that the staff members are you know, kind of putting people in their cars and driving them around. 
And clearly, if they want to grow larger, that's not going to be a, a feasible way to continue to grow. And so maybe they need to think about their, their program design or their, their logic model. Are you familiar with logic models, most, mm -hmm. most people? Um, you know, logic models are sort of very formalized ways of setting out you know, what your goals are and what you sh see as short, medium, and long-term outputs or outcomes. Um, you know, how what you want to do and the strategies that you will use will get you to those various outcomes. So it's, it's a model. Um, so, so in this particular example I'm talking about, you know, maybe they need to think about changing their program design. You know, they're growing, they're changing. It's time to perhaps do things differently. Oh, do oh, you have a comment? Or, oh, okay. Um, are we implementing our program according to plan? Have you ever found this where you, you, know, you kind of have an idea of how your program is supposed to work, but maybe you don't have the resources or the personnel to actually be implementing it appropriately? I know small organizations suffer with that sometimes. Um, you know, maybe you have an organization where uh, families in crisis come in to meet um, with a, a, a counselor, and maybe you know, ideally the program design calls for that counselor to be a social worker, you know, someone who's got a lot of experience and understands the various um, organizations that are available within the community to support those families. And maybe the organization hasn't had the opportunity or the funding or they're going through some personnel changes and so that social worker isn't there. And instead maybe they just have whoever's on staff that day. You know, maybe you're, you're working in public relations but that day you get called in for a couple of hours to, to be an intake, to be an intake person and help families. So that wouldn't really be according to plan, right? I mean, implementing it. Can you see what some of the problems might be with that? You might not be maximizing outcomes. How do you see that that could fall short of the, what, what, how do you see certain outcomes not necessarily being maximized? But what is the solution to that if you're a small organization? It, it's a catch-22. I mean, I guess in that case, you're trying to find the resources to hire that social worker, or if the organization is just in flux, maybe speeding up that process. I know sometimes I, I worked with some organizations where it just seems to take a while to replace a particular employee. Um, maybe they just don't have the time or the focus or the right folks looking at the, that problem. Um, but I think that you know, in, in this particular case, if you've got you know, staff members just kind of filling in on an ad hoc basis, they don't really have the experience um, necessarily to know how to uh, connect those families with the, the resources in the community. They might have the expertise. They might have the time. You know, they're thinking, gosh, I've got to get back to work. So it's just, it's not an optimal <coughs> solution for that program. Oh, yeah, Patina. Um, so I work for the Carousel Center, mm -hmm. which is small, and we're actually creating a program right now with volunteers. So right now we're the only child advocacy center to use volunteers in direct service spaces. Sometimes it's just as simple as seeing what outputs come from other programs um, in different areas and how they've done it. Um, because sometimes not recreating the wheel is your best bet. So if you go to other organizations who did who had an adequate evaluation and you look at their, their outputs and their outcomes and you look at how they sustain certain things that you're dealing with right now, it kind of helps with your transition in, in, into your organization because some organizations have been, they've done it, so they've been where we've been, but if they, no one has just reached out to them to give it, because I'm pretty sure a lot of them wish that somebody had started it before them <laughs> so they could ask them questions. So I mean, I think that Google is your best friend right now. Um, Google and then looking up, just because a lot of the program evaluations are online, so a lot of organizations post them now just because they want to have that transparency. So you can see what, what works, what, you know, what, what their processes were, um, what programs that they use, and, and, mm -hmm. then, and then what ad hoc programs they use until they actually got someone to fill that role. So some people reach out to their local colleges to get interns to fill those positions for them until they can actually go out and, and do that. Keno is really good at you know, pairing you up with someone. <laughs> but I know, like I said, me building that program, a lot of the times I just reach out to people who've already done it, a lot of retirees or a lot of college students who, who pretty much are getting their master's already, so they have some experience. And now the workforce being so slow is your best friend because you can get volunteers who've actually done what you're looking to do for the last 15, 20 years of their life, and now they get got laid off, so they're just trying to learn new things. So mm -hmm. having 
having researching other people's evaluations can actually help develop your own. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so much information out there right now. It's, you know, so many how-to manuals almost if you're looking at other people's program evaluation. Absolutely. Yeah, so you, you know, and, and lastly, you might want to evaluate what your program has achieved. We've been talking about outputs and outcomes and community impact. So that's another thing we can measure. Um, cost efficiency. Um, we just want to see if the funds that we're using are being used in the best, uh, most efficient way, their highest and best use. Is there a better way that we can be getting that particular outcome within the community? Um, we talked about, I, I worked with this organization where uh, they said that they had raised high school graduation rates by you know 2% over this period. And I looked at their programs and I'm like, well, gosh, there's no, nothing that you're doing really leads toward that. So why is that one of your outcomes? It doesn't seem to make sense to me that that would be one of your outcomes. Um, and so they ended up kind of refocusing their efforts. Um, but you know, I just couldn't quite make the connection there. So I don't think that was the best use of their, their resources. Um, if they were chasing a goal that they really didn't have any you know, direct efforts toward. So, so there are a lot of elements of a program evaluation. This is just kind of a group of them. First, you want to figure out who your stakeholders are. And you know, I'm kind of surprised, almost every time I work with an organization, you know, they really have to think about who their stakeholders are. You know, we all know our clients, of course, and our funders, but who else might be some of your stakeholders? Oh, I'm sorry? Oh, I thought I heard something. Members of the community, uh-huh. And, and what's important about members of the community? Um, my for my organization, because I'm trying to produce for citizens, right? They're the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're a big impress. So when we reduce tax rates and stop housing people and in, in incarcerating them, that makes a difference. Yes. So the community is the biggest stakeholder. Yes, absolutely. Community is a huge stakeholder. Community can also be a source for, for future staff members, for future donors, for future board members, for future volunteers. You know, there, there are lots of different stakeholders you want to think about. But if you have a, a large volunteer corps, they're stakeholders. You know, your organization might not run as effectively without them. Um, you know, your board members, maybe your, your past board members. You know, there are lots of different folks who care about your organization. You know, I'm just interested community members who follow you in the paper, you know, and they just find what you do really interesting. Oh, yeah, Deb? We started a thing, because um, it seemed like, if, you're, if you guys aren't familiar with the military, which that would be shocking here in Hobbs County, <laughs> um, you know, they all, all the units have family readiness officers, and they're the conduit between the green side and the families and all that for everything that's going on. And they turn over a lot, because a lot of times they're military <coughs> spouses. So uh, we want them to know every, all the programs and services that the USO offers. So we started doing a stakeholders luncheon, and we would invite anybody who's got a stake in the lives of our troops and their families. Mm -hmm. So we invite the FROs, the Family Readiness Officers, uh, First Sergeants, and then after the first one, the chaplains called screaming, saying, hey, we want to be in there too. We've got a stake in these troops. And then after that one, the next one um, turns out, go figure, we didn't even know about them. There's military family life counselors that are abundant. And so they started to come in and to the point where now that they know that the USO is there, they, they do private counseling with the, with the families and the troops. But they do, it's not documented. Mm -hmm. They don't even have to share their names. It's total privacy. So oftentimes they want to have meetings with these folks somewhere else other than on base for, to protect the privacy. So now they're having like two a day almost at the USO. And it's working out perfectly. And now we know another resource where we can refer these family members to when we hear that they're going through issues. And so your stakeholders are the people that have any kind of a stake in those who you're trying to assist or help, but then you're also going to find out other resources that are out there that might be able to do something better than what you're trying to do or have, are already doing it. Like you said, why reinvent the wheel? Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's very important. You, sometimes we have a tendency to want to protect our nest. Well, we're the ones that do this. You know, you don't, you go away. We want to do it. 
but that's not always the best approach. And by reaching out, you find out that you're going to be able to even be bigger and better and have more opportunities, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, potential partners, partnering organizations. You might, you know, today that might not seem like there's a connection, but, you know, soon there might be. Eventually there might be. As the community's needs change. Thank you. Well, I, I'll move down to a couple of other elements here. Um, you know, when you're looking at a, uh, when you're looking at your programs, you also want to look at your program goals and your mission to see if what you're doing aligns with that. You know, I think Natasha had asked, well, how many folks know their mission statement? You know, and I serve on a board, and I don't know exactly what mine is either. You know, but but I think it's good to to refresh yourself and to figure out if your efforts are moving toward that. And that's something that you do as well in strategic planning. I mean, a lot of I do strategic planning as well, and a lot of these elements work in both. Um, but you want to look at that. You want to look at your current strategies, policies, and procedures to see how you're trying to achieve the goals that you've set out for your organization. Uh, you want to look at your current data collection efforts. I, I worked with an organization, I guess, last summer, and they were an organization that had been around for, I think, almost 60 years. And they had a lot of um, different divisions. And the director of development had asked me to come in and to look at all their data collection efforts. And it was really interesting because some folks had computerized databases. Some people just had piles and piles of paper, you know, that they kept their records on. Because who has time to set up a database, you know, and, and put your put your data in there? You know, there were folders. There were people tracking the same data in different parts of the organization. And so, you know, part of a program evaluation is sort of figuring out, well, what kind of data is being collected? How much of it is important to have? How much of it is just a waste of everyone's time? You know, the client that you're asking that data of. You know, the people who are inputting or recording that data. Um, you know, I, I also look at, and, and something you'd want to do is to look at what your grantor's requirements are as well. You know, are you getting all the data that your grantors are going to be, you know, asking for from you? Um, so, I, you know, that's, I think, an important part of it is just figuring out what data is out there already. Um, what, when I work with data systems, I try to build on what already exists, you know, rather than creating, I, I talked to some folks earlier this week about that, um, you know, rather than, than creating a whole bunch of new work for the organization, the organizational members are busy just doing direct service. So I, you know, at least my philosophy is to try to build on what you have uh, and maximize its use. Um, I also like to look at what kind of baselines you've already set for yourselves as an organization, either through your strategic planning efforts or perhaps just in some general goal documents that you've put together. And, and with those baselines, what, what milestones you have. You know, within, um, I've seen these in some of the Department of Education grants where they say, you know, within a year we will improve uh, attendance rates by 3%, in two years we'll have improved them by 5%, and so on. So you know, does your organization have those set out? And what are you doing toward those milestones? Um, you know, the stakeholders, I I've never met a group of stakeholders who don't have an opinion about some <laughs> aspect, or you probably have experienced this as well, of your organization. And I think, you know, honestly, I think that's probably your richest source of feedback, um, you know, and, and richest source of information for evaluating your program. I just, you know, I, I oftentimes, my, when I work with clients, they'll say, well, do we need to include this group? Do we need to include this group? And, and I say, yeah, 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 because I just feel like the more perspectives that you have, you know, you, to me, you can only gain from that, you know, it's just people see things differently from different perspectives. And so why not include, you know, a, a, anybody you'll ask, they might not want to, um, but why not cast as wide a net as possible? Um, and, and then I also do, um, and, and I encourage you to do background research uh, and an environmental scan. And uh, you were actually, you kind of uh, were my infomercial for this already, Fatima, but you said that, you know, there are best practices out there already. And so why not look at what organizations, other organizations are doing, you know, how much they're able to move the needle every year. You know, and I, I just mentioned uh, graduation rates or, or attendance rates. You know, how, how much do successful organizations actually move them every year? You, know, you try to get a sense of, of things like that. Um, does anyone know like what an environmental scan is, or do you conduct environmental scans? Would you like to share? Well, I'm, I'm just thinking of one right now. 
where the city provides funding to nonprofit organizations. So when I think of environmental scan, the city manager's already kind of sent a message that the city budget's gonna be tight and they may not even be funding available next year. That's important for nonprofits to know, to plan for, yes. that they historically receive money from the city. What happens if that's not there? Do you have an alternative source? So being, being aware of what's going on in your environment. Absolutely. That's well, that's a buzz killer. Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, but that's that's well, important that to know. The end of every year, so yeah. know. <laughs> you want to know the, the budget environment, the political environment, the legal environment, you know, all these different things. I, I work with um, a, a lot of health departments around the state um, for this one program that works with children and youth with special health care needs. And you know, there are a couple of big shifts environmentally over the last few years. Uh, the state has changed from a uh, case management system for families to one that's more managed care. And that's caused a lot of issues for yeah, you shaking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, have you found that with the family? Oh, absolutely, with the, the various um, programs that have been affected by that change has been pretty significant. Yeah. It doesn't look like in a good way. Well, it, it, not in a positive way in the sense that um, the fu the monies are very limited, and mm -hmm. that's, you know, we've all been affected by that. But um, the sense of, of empowerment has kind of been just um, <laughs> kind of, it's gone away because yes. it's someone else managing, uh, per se, your care and your life. Yes. So. And a lot of families just felt really lost. I mean, it was just a wrenching transition for some families. Mm -hmm. person in care of their life. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, you know, for, for uh, health programs, that was certainly an issue, at least the ones I've worked with. Also, of course, the transition that our health system is, is going through right now. You know, whatever you think of Obamacare, it certainly has been a seismic shift in, in the you know, distribution of health or, or the way in which uh, health care is provided or paid for in our country. And so that has lots of ramifications for different programs. So I think an environmental scan is a good way to kind of just get a sense of, of what's, you know, what's happening that could affect you in the outside world. Um, these are some of the elements in which these are some of the questions that you want to ask when you're working either with an external evaluator or with your evaluator team. You want to try to answer some of these questions as you go into the evaluation process. Um, I, you know, I can use an example just for our, our efforts here. Um, you know, say for example, we have um, an after-school reading program, and it's for children who ha need some extra help in reading, and maybe their grades two and three, and they go to this program after school, and they do some peer reading um, with children in fourth and fifth grade. Okay, so that's the program, um, and so now we want to evaluate it. So, you know, I guess I'll just throw it out to everyone. You know, what kind of things would we want to evaluate? That's our, our program. Mm -hmm. See if the kids' grades have improved. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Yep. Have grades improved? Or not even, sometimes people don't test well, so just kind of seeing how well they were reading when they first got there. So you would give them some basic type of book mm -hmm. that they may read and then see after the program could they read through that book better yes. than what they did before and then that that would like so how how many books they get through mm -hmm. during that time kind of shows you where their reading has has, has gone based upon because I know like a lot of kids they don't test well in yeah. school so they but they could be tremendous readers mm -hmm. and that peer on peer reading with their peer could actually help them way better than being in a classroom with 35 kids and yes. not one teacher Yes, absolutely. So, so measuring it perhaps by the number of books that have been read, by grades. Um, I guess, you know, we, we would want to as a group come up with some criteria that we would judge that performance. You know, if, if the child's grades go up by, yeah, using numbers, say they, their average was a 75 and it went up to a 76, do we consider that improvement? Or would we want to see it go up to an 83? You know, we, we'd have to as a group decide that. How do we measure that? Um, you know, in, in the case of, of reading books, if the child reads three books over the course of the semester, is that considered successful? Or, or do they need to read six or eight groups? You know, how do we decide that? 
you know, if, if we give them a, a simple book at the beginning, you know, like a, uh, maybe a, if they're in second grade and we give them a kindergarten book and they read that, and then by the end of the program they're reading at a first grade level, do we consider that success or do we want to see them at their grade level? And so see, these are some of the things we have to decide up front when we start to look at all this data and, and you know, when we start to figure out what data we want to gather. You know, kind of have to have some criteria uh, for success, for measuring success. Um, in addition to some of the evidence that we talked about, can you think of some other things that might help us to decide whether um, metrics, data, or outcomes that might decide that the pro help to decide the program has been successful? Maybe if you measured uh, special needs children, if they have um, uh, in comparison to other students that do not have like IEPs and things like that, trying to test them before and after to see if what you're doing is impacting their results. That's great. Yeah, that's that's terrific. We might also look at attitudes toward reading. You know, I think sometimes it's a confidence issue too. You know, kids say, you know, I'm not a good reader, so I hate reading. You know, and that's the end of it. But maybe if they're reading with this older child who they think is really cool or fun or, you know, whatever, and, and they start to feel more confident about their abilities. So maybe you look at attitudes or confidence toward reading as well. So you really just kind of dig, dig, dig to come up with ways to measure the success of that program. And any other uh, thoughts about how we might measure it? We uh, um, actually <coughs> surveyed our clients, mm -hmm. especially after like events or um, an extended program like the Emory 360 thing. And uh, it's anonymous, so they feel very confident and comfortable saying if, some, if there's something they don't care for. Yeah. Like, as a matter of fact, that stakeholder lunch and this blew my mind. And the uh, um, survey after that, several of the people said w we brought in um, different vendors like Veterans United Home Loans and different companies like that that provide services to the military but they can't afford to actually advertise on base. And the family rating this officer said they wish we had more vendors there and more time to spend with the vendors because their world is on the base, and they didn't know a lot of this stuff was out there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, these are people that are selling them, whoever wants to be sold to, but there, there is quite a few people that mentioned that. And I was like, who knew, you know? So yeah. th I thought that was, um, they're telling us the need that they have felt, need to have filled. It was, it's that's amazing. That's great. That's, that's wonderful when you can get and that dialogue. Invite other nonprofits in. The United Way comes in, and a couple others. Mm -hmm. There's, there's lots of different ways to get that, that feedback, you know, to understand what the outcomes are. So you just want to try to think creatively about that, how you might measure your program. I guess lastly on this, you want to think about, well, what are you going to do with the results of your program evaluation? Um, I used to work for the North Carolina School of Science and Math, and so I would prepare these, these big fat reports, you know, bigger than this, <laughs> you know, and I'd, I'd, um, they'd get passed to my boss, passed to their boss, passed to their boss, and then it would get eventually up to like the chancellor of the system and then he would just kind of put it on the shelf and that would be the end of it, you know? And so I, I used to joke that I was a, a, you know, an author of many unread reports. Like that was my, you know, my title, my unofficial title. Um, but I think it's, you know, funders really want to understand that when you, you go through this exercise and it's a lot of work, you know, to evaluate your program. A lot of people are involved, you have lots of thinking. So you come up with this result they just want to know that you're going to do something with it, that you're not going to put it on a shelf, that you know, the folks who are going to be reviewing it don't really have any authority to look at recommendations, approve you know, changes, implementation changes, oversee implementation changes. Um, so one thing that I, you know, I strongly suggest to organizations is to try to develop some sort of uh, continuous improvement process. I heard um, uh, Chairman Buchanan use the word CIP, what does that mean? Capital, in capital oh, capital improvement, capital okay. Because I kept thinking continuous improvement. I'm saying, well, wait, what is, okay. It means a lot of things in a lot of Oh, okay. <laughs> well, my CIP is continuous improvement, and that is a, a criteria for a lot of the, you know, the grants that I review. Yeah, you know, they want to know what, who, who is going to look at these results? How, or how often are you going to create this data? You know, this, this program evaluation, is it, quarterly, is it annually, whatever, but once you do that, who's going to be looking at it? You know, what kind of decisions are they going to make with it? Who has the authority to say, okay, we're going to do, and is that person on that committee? 
and then who has the authority to say, okay, um, you know, Natasha, please start to implement some of this, you know, and, and then to oversee it and monitor it as well. So that's an important part of, of program evaluation as well, is knowing what you're going to do with the results. Oh, please. One of the, I think one of the skepticism or at least um, some of the, I, I guess, um, negative view uh, with respect to program evaluation has been based on um, the notion that most people will design program evaluation and then if the results or the outcomes are not being um, favorable, mm -hmm especially when, it, when it's tied to funding, mm -hmm. that we tend to just then develop a different criteria or come up with reasons why the criteria. And so the public at large, whenever you hear evaluation or research, they say, well, you know, people change their statistics depending on, uh, sure. so, so that's part of the skepticism. Would you speak to how, um, especially for nonprofits, which is so important, um, the results are so important because it's tied to funding, but mm -hmm. yet we want to remain objective and we want to remain honest. Yes. Um, would you speak to some of that? Because that's kind of the elephant in the middle of the, oh. of the living room when, we, when we're talking about evaluation sure. and, and research. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I mean, that's, that's really important. Um, I, I know that's a concern. You know, numbers lie, statistics lie. You can make them say anything you want. Exactly. I mean, I think there are a couple of ways to approach that. You know, I know a lot of organizations need to do the work internally because they don't necessarily have the funds to do an outside evaluator. I know for the Department of Education, we want to see that you have an outside evaluator. That's just like, objectivity, you know, for that set of object of objective eyes because those are huge grants exactly. you know that that are being offered to these these cities or municipalities or counties and they want to know that someone's watching to see how well that program uh, works exactly. um, in the case of, of smaller organizations if you can't work with an outside evaluator I think it's helpful to have uh, perhaps a few members of the board or to bring in a member of your community you know someone who can be a, a bit more objective who's not right in in there um, I think it's also helpful, you know, if you get the results back and, you know, some things don't look great for your organization, I think that it's okay to say, you know, okay, we recognize this is a need and here's how we're going to address it. I mean, Craig, would you say that if you see that, that there are results that maybe aren't as strong, but you see that an organization has a plan to address that, that it's... Yeah. I think that, you know, if, if, if um, you know, if you've got 10 results and five look great, three look okay, and two, you're like, oh, why did we do this? You know, I think it's okay, you know, to talk about them in the context of, you know, here's everything our organization does. Okay. You know, we've identified these areas of concern. We have a plan. You know, here, and, you know, I, I always, when I do strategic planning, I'm always, I make people say, who's responsible for this? What's the deadline? What exactly are you going to do? You know, I don't let people leave the room until we have that information. And, and I think that that's something that you can do as well, is just you know, be able to report to your funders, you know, Mr. Smith is going to be working on this with a team of three people. Mr. Smith has a background in X, Y, and Z, so he's well prepared you know, to take this on. Um, you know, by July 30th, Mr. Smith will have done this, this, and this. We will be back to measure this again September 1st. You know, so that you showed, remember that wheel we looked at at the beginning. Absolutely you know, that something is happening, that you are addressing it. Um, I think that would be my, my suggestion. Has anyone else dealt with that or have some ideas about how they might deal with that? Okay. Thank you for the question. That's a good question. I guess I'm going to kind of quickly, I don't know, are we okay for time? We have about five minutes and then question and answer. Okay. I can move through this pretty quickly. Um, the tools that evaluators are going to use, you know, we talked about some opinion research, um, you know, that you might do interviews, surveys, focus groups, there are lots of different ways to gather information from your stakeholders. Surveys, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's quite an exercise. Um, you, you look at the data, as I mentioned earlier, it's being collected now by an organization, whether it's in a, a computer database, whether it's in just a bunch of files or, or pieces of paper, or an institutional memory that, you know, I, I used to work for American Express, and when I had a question about this one system, they'd say, go ask Janet. And I'd say, okay, and I'd go ask Janet, I'd get, and it dawned on me, what if Janet left the, com you know, the company? It wasn't written down anywhere. 
So you want to try to figure out where those sources of information are and, and try to formalize them to, to some extent. Um, you want to look at strategic plans or mission or vision statements, uh, maybe evaluations before. You know, what happened as a result of that evaluation? Did something actually occur? Were changes made? Who made those changes? Yeah, and then what was the result of that? Um, you look at just kind of brochures and, and public documents that sort of give you a sense of the mission and priorities of the organization. You look at benchmarks. Um, Fatima had mentioned that other organizations, you know, do things in a particularly successful way. You want to look at the benchmarks and milestones that they have. Um, the background research and environmental scanning results um, are also very helpful to provide a context for everything that you're thinking about. quickly through what you can expect from a, a program evaluation. So we've gathered all this data, and, and now you know, what do we do with it? What's going to result from this? Um, you know, the way I do it anyway, and I think most do, is that you come up with a summary, first of all, of your stakeholders' opinions and feedback regarding a variety of, of issues, you know, what your organization does well, where they might be able to do things a little better. You know, everyone can improve. Um, and so what opportunities are there for your organization? What does the, the organization, what's the opinion of it out in the community? What's the perception of it out in the community? When I worked for the School of Science and Math, we kept hearing that we are the best kept secret in North mm -hmm. Carolina. I don't know if you're all familiar with it, the North mm -hmm. Carolina School of Science and Math. It's this amazing jewel of an institution, but nobody knows about it, you know? <laughs> So, so I think it's important to see what the community knows, and, and you'll find that out through the feedback. Um, the extent to which your organization is actually aligning with your strategic goals and your mission statement. Uh, and then I guess this got a little uh, uh, suggestions for growth and, and direction. Everyone's got an opinion, and you will hear many things, some of which aren't feasible, but some of which might be helpful. You can also expect measurable data um, you know, from all of these different sources, and, and you can use that to report to your current funders, to potential new funders, um, for benchmarking. You know, you've got a set of benchmarks now. If you didn't have them before, you've got benchmarks now for future growth. Um, you can benchmark it against other organizations. I do that for these clients I mentioned uh, who work with children and youth with special health care needs. You know, they might find it in their particular county 10% of the parents have an easy time getting referrals to another service. That's actually not that bad, you know, compared to state averages and national averages. So you've got your data to benchmark against other people in the field to see where you, where you stand. You also have bragging rights. You know, I, I get asked oftentimes in strategic planning from people who are doing fundraising, and they say, well, what do I, they're board members, and they say, well, what do I say to potential funders, and now you'll have a lot of data to say, well, we serve this many children or, or families or animals or, or you know, conservation efforts. Here's what we've done. Here's our impact on the community. Um, so you know, as I mentioned, you'll have a, a sense of how well what you're doing aligns with what you say you want to do and your promise to the community. Um, you might have suggestions regarding how you might take your current programs and streamline them or add to them or, or perhaps eliminate some programs from your overall um, you know, activities. You'll have, uh, perhaps you'll have some recommendations regarding being more efficient or effective with what you do. And you'll have this, this great data-driven story. Um, you know, people like numbers, um, at least, I mean, I don't know. I'm a numbers geek, so I'm very biased, but I think that People appreciate seeing numbers. It, it helps them to understand uh, organizations. So what do you do with your results? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, OK. Well, here's what you do. <laughs> um, do you have any questions? Can we get copies of the PowerPoint? Um, sure. I, I could forward that. Or and we'll, we'll post the, um, the resources from the conference on our website, too. Um, on United Ways? Mm -hmm. OK. Yep. We'll send out an email to everyone. Thanks. I think that's it. Well, thank, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you.